serve or reconstruct itself, since I'll use denominational names. Prior to the advent of the modern world, and let me focus specifically on Europe, it makes absolutely no sense to speak about individual rights. It makes no sense whatsoever. The point of the medieval world is that it is a corporate world. Your status is accorded you as a member of a corporate group. Whether you are the nobility, peasant, or a Jew, to be a Jew in the pre-modern world meant not only that culturally and religiously you were informed almost exclusively by Jewish teachings, but your status was a Jewish status. Let me go back to America. Israel is a little more complex on this issue because there are elements clearly of corporate political status to being a Jew here in Israel that wouldn't be true in America. If I go back to New York City and I jaywalk and they were to give me a ticket, and I would tell the arresting officer in New York City, oh, but officer, I'm Jewish. <laughs> the officer in this case would have said, you know, I heard David Ellenson speak at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs in July. And you're probably telling me that you're Jewish, but it's based on a misunderstanding of what he said to you. You're telling me you're Jewish because had you lived in the Middle Ages and you had violated a law, the Jewish community actually was a corporation of uh, public significance and public status. And if you violated a law, you would really have gone to a Jewish court. Rabbis were not spiritual <coughs> ministers. Rabbis quite literally were Dayani. They could throw you in jail. They could have you fined. In Spain, they even uh, executed people. Uh, for those of us who live in the diaspora and are rabbis, we think of these as the halcyon days of the, uh, of the rabbinate, if we could only return to them. With the advent of modernity, the community is destroyed as a corporation, as a public corporation. And <coughs> modernity is based on individual rights. Professor Hertzberg used to always emphasize, and for him, this is when modernity began. When did the French Revolution become a real revolution? Became a genuine revolution when the estates were dissolved. Once you begin to say one man, one vote, if you assert we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and all you have to do is go back and look at all the debates in Europe in the late, eight, late 1700s, early 1800s, the only question is, are Jews men? And if Jews are men, even if you do not like them, you have to emancipate them. Are blacks men? If they are men, you have to emancipate them. And are women men? If women are men, you have to even extend the right to vote to them. By the way, historically, it can be 130 years between the adoption, ratification of the American Constitution and the extension of the right of suffrage to women. It doesn't mean Kaharif Ayin, uh, immediately everything changes. But you should note what begins to occur the Jewish community for the first time in history to be a Jew in the West and anti-Semitism will be the counterweight to all of this. To be a Jew is a matter of voluntarism. If I as a rabbi in the United States want people to observe kashrut, to give tzedakah, etc., I have no coercive legal authority at my disposal. I have no, as sociologists would put it, imperative religious authority. I do have influential authority. If a person's been raised in a certain kind of way and has certain values, I may be able to speak to them in a way that I can issue a directive, and they will in fact observe it. But even in the most traditional precincts in Brooklyn or Monsey, and this would be psychologically difficult for many people, but they can put a dollar and a quarter in the subway and just leave. There is no public authority that is going to coerce people into, into doing this. This means that the Jewish community with the advent of modernity, particularly in the West, becomes a voluntaristic community. Israel is so complex that I only hesitate to give my analysis of Israel because in Israel you have certain elements that are just like what I've spoken about in terms of uh, distance from traditional Jewish culture. I will tell you, I was at a 
meeting last Saturday night, Mosa A. Shabbat, there were 10 university presidents from the United States, some of you may have read this in the paper, brought here by the American Jewish Committee on Project Interchange. Then they brought in, for whatever reason, Yehuda Reinhardt, president of Brandeis, and me. And there were presidents of a number of Israeli universities, uh, including the Hebrew University, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, not Bar Ilan, Tel Aviv, Haifa, the Negev, and then other colleges here. I, I almost hesitate to say this, but I will say it because I think it illustrates something. They made Havdalah. Uh, two of the Israeli college university presidents, I, I, I don't, I'm still trying to understand this, uh, had never seen the ceremony before. One of them actually and one of them actually did not even know what it was. Um, the other had heard of it as a rumor. Had heard of it. I don't know how it was <laughs> even it. true. Well, I mean, I, I only say this here because Israel, it does not mean that people are not Meshulavim. I would almost call it but, but Tarbut Sarah. I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just a reality that it does worry me because as someone who's very concerned about uh, the establishment of uh, Sharim Hadukim, really strong relationships between Israel and the diaspora. When people are that devoid, I mean, I, I am making a judgment here. I'm leaving my academic realm for a moment. I tried to be just descriptive. When people are that devoid of elements of Jewish tradition, it becomes hard to create a, a kind of common culture that would unite one group of people to another, and that's something that we have to work on. Simultaneously, one does have to remember that in Israel there is the rhythm of a Hebrew calendar, uh, the Jewish language. I mean, there are, there are lots of differences. We have 40 Israeli rabbinical students now at Hebrew Union College studying for the Reform Rabbinate in Israel. I won't tell you the backgrounds that some of them have in the sense of how little they know about Judaism. They're actually not much different than many of the North American students we have, but I will say this. If Hebrew is your mama if Hebrew, I shouldn't mix that, if Hebrew is your native language, you actually can learn to read the sources much, much more quickly than if, uh, <laughs> than if it is not. But you have these religious, cultural, and social changes, which brings me then, the three of these together mark the modern period as unique. There comes then to be a fourth area of change, and this is the challenge of what this, I can then move to specific examples as part of the discussion. You get an area of social change. By the third generation in the West, after these changes have taken place, namely, when culturally Jews know more about non-Jewish culture than Jewish culture, which means, again, I want to re-emphasize this, that they are not only removed from Jewish culture, but even when they judge Jewish culture, they judge it in light are largely of values taken from the larger world, when religiously they no longer believe in or practice the divinity of uh, traditional Jewish law and belief, and when politically the community is destroyed as a public corporation and coercive political authority no longer appears, by the third generation in every Western country where Jews have lived, France, Germany, England, the United States, by the third generation, the Jewish rate of exogamy, the Jewish rate of intermarriage in the West rises minimally to 33%. What this means is all my grandparents immigrated from Eastern Europe to America. There is no intermarriage in that generation. Their children, my parents, there is no intermarriage for a couple of reasons. One is that the taboo against exogamy, I'm trying to use sociological language, is so internalized that children of immigrants, at least in regard to intermarriage, often internalize, generally internalize, the parental disapproval of marrying outside one's ethnic group. By the third generation, when you get to the grandchildren, the Jewish rate of intermarriage reaches one in three. For there to be high rates of intermarriage, exogamy, from a sociological perspective, there have to be two variables present. One, members of the ethnic group have to be highly, highly acculturated 
into the host society? And what would be the second variable that has to be present? For there to be a sociologically significant rate of exogamy or intermarriage. Okay. They have to be acceptable. In other words, the host society has to see members of that group as acceptable and or desirable marriage partners. My colleague at Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles, Bruce Phillips, showed me that in the 1980s, and I don't know what to do about this in light of uh, a resurgence of anti-Semitism that we certainly see in Europe, but in the United States, around 1985, a Gallup poll was taken. And by the way, Jews cannot believe this, because in large measure, what's our tradition? They tried to kill us. We won. Hooray, let's eat. I mean, that's kind of, we have internalized, for good reason, you know, just because we're paranoid doesn't mean there really have been people out to get us, and I think there still are. But leaving that aside, when the question was asked, white Christian Americans, how would you feel if your child married a Jew? They were given four choices. One, I'd be very happy if my child married a Jew. Two, it would be all right. Three, I would not like it. Four, I would really hate it, and this would be completely unacceptable. How many people do you think answered, I'd be really happy if my child married a Jew? 40%. Yeah, 22, 22 percent. How many do you think answered, you know, I, I don't know that I'd choose it, but it would be all right. 60. 60. Yes, you're quite correct. It was 64 percent. 86 percent of people in the United States when asked, Christian white Americans, when asked, how would you feel if your child married a Jew? Basically, it would be fine. If you want to know why you have, and I'll let Steve Cohen and Sergio and others fight about this. In other words, is it 43 percent? Is it 52? I, I can tell you this. I'm a qualitative, not a quantitative sociologist. The answer is it's a lot. There are a lot of Jews who intermarry. There are a lot of Jews who intermarry. The reality is that what you get by the time you get the 1990 American Jewish population study is that you have a 50% intermarriage rate. With a 50% intermarriage rate, two-thirds of your families are intermarried. These two Jews marry a born Jew. That's one family. This Jew marries someone born non-Jewish. This Jew marries someone born non-Jewish. And keep in mind all the complexities. People that are married, they raise their children Jewishly. People that are married, there are conversions. But from an ethnic, sociological perspective, two-thirds of your families are mixed. That is a reality that the world Jewish community is going to have to confront, particularly when we consider, for example, American-Israeli uh, relations in the years ahead. I do not know the figures from, let's say, a country like Australia, looking to the gentleman to my left. 20 years behind the time. 20 years behind, because I'll tell you why. Because in large measure, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Australian Jewish community was largely created by people who were Holocaust survivors. They're the first generation. So then my friends who are Australian, who are my age, I mean, I will say, I do not speak Yiddish. My parents did. My friends my age in Australia do speak Yiddish because that was the language in their home. Their children do not speak Yiddish by the third generation. In another 20 years, in a country that promotes integration as an ideal, these are the challenges Judaism confronts. The statistics on intermarriage arise when all these other changes have occurred. May I just... Just, no, just one last sentence and then I'll... It's not a question. It's not a question. It's not a question. It is an addendum. Sure. I read here in one, I don't know how to do it, the perspective of inside the Jewish community towards the outside of the Jewish community, that 52%, there's an American Jewish community poll, that 52% American Jewry believe that opposition to oh, is, is negative is racist. Is racist. racist. Is racist. I actually yeah. suspect yes, that is a true statistic. It so, just goes to, no, 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 no. It's a good point. I mean, the only point I just wanted to end up with is here's really the amazing thing, and this is what my book is about. And whether I'm writing about Rabbi Hildesheimer or Reformed prayer books, or even rabbis in Israel on issues. Two of the essays in this book dealt with uh, the whole halakhic debate within the Orthodox community about extending the right to vote to women, and then the notion of women being extended the right to study uh, Torah Shev'al uh, Jewish oral law, Talmud. 
Leaving those aside for a minute, Professor Katz in his book, and with this I will conclude, and then let's open it up, Out of the Ghetto, Jewish Social Emancipation in Europe from 1770 to 1870. Actually, after mm -hmm. describing all this and looking at the pace, here's what the really remarkable thing is. And I think Professor Katz is again correct. In light of everything I've described, you might expect that Judaism would completely atrophy and die. The amazing thing is, Lomrot, despite all of these changes that we've talked about, the overwhelming majority of Jews, in one way or another, desire to retain some sense of Jewish identity. Patrilineality is only a problem because Jews violate a traditional communal norm. That is to say, they intermarry and they want their children to be part of the community. If what occurred in America today was what occurred by and large in Germany in the 19th century, Yaakov Turi, the Tel Aviv University historian, has pointed out and even though we have many true vote from this period that deal with intermarriage, by and large in Germany or France in the 19th century when you intermarried, it meant you went schmad. I mean, you, you left. People intermarried today and in a Judaism in the world, as Arnie Eisen and Steve Cohen have put it, of the sovereign self, America, they want on their terms to remain within the Jewish community and to identify as Jews. The, the real miracle of Jewish life is not that we have the degrees of assimilation and um, non-identification that we have. You could look at it the other way. In light of all of these sociological conditions, how is it that Judaism responded in so many different ways so as to make Judaism viable? So that when I look at whether it's Abraham Geiger or Osriel Hildesheim or whether it's Solomon Schechter or Chaim David Halevi. For me, the framework of this book, and really all of my work, is to try to say, in light of these common sets of conditions, how have Jews responded to the challenges of modernity? And the story is really a variegated one. And I think the best way to look at these things, and here I will say something about denominations. Denominations arose as responses to this. But denominations also arose, particularly in America, because of sociological cleavages between Eastern European and German Jews. The folk Judaism of Eastern European Jews became conservative Judaism. The folk Judaism of the German Jews became classical reform Judaism. These denominations, <laughs> I better be careful given that I'm a denominational leader, but I will say this, are actually probably not a very useful way, in my opinion, to look at what the challenges are that face Judaism and modernity today. That does not mean on elite levels there are not ideological distinctions between the movements. But rather what I would say is that if you were to look at how it is that Jews live in the world, what we see in a whole variety of ways are different attempts to create pluralistic paths where Jews in a world where we will never again experience in Rabbi Soloveitchik's terms, Brit uh, a covenant of common religious purpose, we can nevertheless, I hope, create a landscape where at least we can affirm a Brita Goral, a covenant of common destiny and fate. And this book and my work is an attempt, I will say, to describe with great respect, I hope, the efforts of a whole variety of people along this continuum to continue to try to make Judaism viable, and now I'm going to add another word, authentic, and over that, people have tremendous disagreements, viable and authentic in a modern setting. So thank you very much. It was a lot of work. So now comments, questions, Shlomo? Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Let me, we, we do that in order. Shalom Friedman, Edward Cohen, Dr. Ephraim Zorov, Isi Libla, Ashley Trelli. Now I have to remember all that. <laughs> uh, we have? Yeah, uh, David, thank you for the really illuminating talk. I learned a great deal from it. Um, however, a few contradictions. Two thirds Only a few? of the no, there are a lot of things to say and a lot of things to ask, but one question only. Uh, two thirds of the families which intermarry do not raise their children, as far as I know, oh, as, right. as yeah. Jewish. Secondly, in the whole picture of what the Jewish world has become through intermarriage, 
all, we're, everyone is talking about the demographic problems of the Jewish people. Certainly part of it comes from intermarriage without putting all the other sociological factors into play. Thirdly, or the same thing, to Jewish identity or Jewish connection is not enough because many people use that Jewish identity and Jewish connection against the common interest of the Jewish people. Norman Finkelstein. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, you don't need to say any more there. Let me make the point. Jews. Yes. No, I just, I wanted to make the following point about the two-thirds. My only point was that on purely an ethnic level, in other words, someone can intermarry. Let, let, let me just finish this. Someone could intermarry, be converted by the most Haredi, stringent rabbi in Mea Sha'arim, from an ethnic point of view, it's still a mixed family, even when halakhically there wouldn't be a problem. My only point was that when you look at studies that people like Cohen and Phillips and others do, I, I never meant to suggest that two-thirds of the families uh, affirm Jewish identity. By the way, it also means that you can have intermarriage from a sociological standpoint where the mother is Jewish and the father isn't where the children have no Jewish identity whatsoever. In other words, they may have halakhic status as Jews, but sociologically and in every other way they do not identify. What sociologists have to do in a country like America is do myriad studies so that of that 67%, 18% identify here, 42% don't there. I, I, I acknowledge, in other words, your, your correctness. What I am saying, though, is that what you do see in American synagogues certainly in reform and many conservative, is that um, there are people who intermarry and do want to remain part of the community. They want synagogue membership. They send their children to Israel. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of actually quite positive things they do that could not run more counter to Norman Finkelstein. I mean, my, my purpose here today wasn't to bring Steve Cohen in and he can give you all the statistics. I am aware of how complex it is, but the point I did want to make and this is why I did quote Jacob Turi, in Germany in the 19th century or France, when people married non-Jews, 98% did not stay in the community. That is not true in America today. And you can look at, you know, the writings of Arnie and Steve Cohen, or you can look at the writings of Bethany Horowitz. What's interesting is that in a world where Jews define themselves as sovereign selves, they're really quite content to borrow from the Jewish tradition in highly idiosyncratic ways that rabbis would have a very difficult time with and use the resources of the tradition in ways that frankly make them happy and grant meaning. Sometimes it leads to the building of community, other times it doesn't. As a, now I'll be a denominational leader, as a leader of reform, this is a challenge that I confront, uh, confront constantly. Um, the larger issue that I think you're you're suggesting here is that you're quite correct. Jewish identity alone isn't enough. Look, I have said this a thousand times. If I had my way, every Jewish child would go to a Jewish day school in the diaspora. If I had my way, every Jewish child would take trips to Israel. If I had my way, every Jewish child would have Jewish camps. Part of what your question reminds me of is that there are things people can do. In other words, I've described broad sociological trends, decisions that people make about how they raise their children have a tremendous impact on the outcome of Jewish identity. And without Jewish knowledge, and I think it's why I brought up the example of the Israeli presidents, without Jewish knowledge, we face tremendous challenges. I know that Ehud Olmert at the conference the other day made a statement of uh, the conference of the Jewish People Policy, Policy, Policy Institute. Institute. Policy Planning Institute. It's a hard word for me, the hard words for me to say said that, you know, he said first, I, and we don't need any comments on this, I'm just reporting what I think <laughs> he said. He said, today said, I am first a Jew, and I am second an Israeli. And he said 30 years ago, he would have said, I'm an Israeli first, and then a Jew. The issue for me, in some measure, is how do you promote... Well, for, these kids probably think the opposite. That well, that's the anyway, the issue... The I, I, I am not trying to comment on the Prime Minister <laughs> and uh, his personal way of approaching Judaism. I bring it up here because I'm aware of how unbelievably complex these things are, and you do hope for a certain kind of uh, Jewish content. You didn't ask me this, but now I will tell you some of my own views. The question is then, what should the Jewish community do in a policy way? Yeah. 
in light of this reality. And here, I would decide Lakula. And there are two rabbis who always guide me here. One is Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher, and the other, Eliyahu Gutmacher. They were two of the forerunners. Well, Kalisher was, you know, lo rak achad me mevas rei tzion, hu hayayim hei hayadiyah ha mevas rei tzion. He wrote the book Rishat Tzion, Seeking Zion. 1864. What? Yes, 1864, New Orleans, Louisiana. Jews, believe it or not, are intermarried. Children born to non-Jewish mothers, irreligious Jewish fathers. The rabbi of the community, Rabbi Dove Illoui, Bernard Illoui, was a graduate of the Pressburg Yeshiva. He had a very distinguished rabbinic career in America. Uh, can look at this in a couple of ways. I leave it with all the scholars to interpret it. He served seven pulpits in 19 years. You have now a choice. Either he wasn't really very effective in any of these places, or he had so much Torah to teach, and he wanted to go to so many places that he moved every uh, two to three years. Rabbi Eloi said, it is usher, it is forbidden to circumcise these boys, offer them to Vila, and bring them into the Jewish community. Two Moalim in New Orleans at that point. <coughs> By the way, I always love this. Remember, this is the Civil War in America. Hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Brother against brother, sister against sister. What I do like about our people, we always know what's most important. <laughs> be who you can be. I mean, the whole world can be blowing up, but we know what to fight about. Uh, Rabbi Illoui sends then, by the way, two Moalim, and this is what modernity means. One more, he says, you cannot do these circumcisions. One Moal then says, I can't do them. The rabbi forbade it. Another Moal named Mr. Goldenberg mm -hmm. basically says, so what? Bring the children to me, give me my fee, and I'll be happy to circumcise them. In other words, that's what modernity does when you don't have coercive political power. The question is, what should the policy of the community be? He writes to Europe, and I want to be fair about this, virtually every rabbi he writes to supports him. Though interestingly, the rabbis who support them are German rabbis. He writes to a magazine called De Israelit, which was an orthodox publication in Germany in the mid-19th century, edited by Marcus Lehmann, Hirsch, Hildesheimer, all of them agree with what Rabbi Hillary wrote. Kalischer reads about this, and he says, I want to write, you know, to... Uh, the Godel, the one who was the greatest among you. And there's an actually an interesting halakha correspondence between Kalisher and Hirsch, or Kalisher and Hildesheimer. Kalisher writes, Rabbi Kalisher writes, that uh, it's not only permitted, it's in fact a mitzvah to circumcise these children. And this is his reasoning. First, he says, it's a mitzvah to circumcise anybody, whether they're Jewish or non-Jewish. God wishes every male, not the females. Uh, I won't get into biology here. Uh, God would like everybody to be circumcised, all males. But then, he actually goes on to say the following. He says, well, what about the fathers? He says, you know, these people are really Poshe Yisrael. But then he has, and this is a line I do like, Lifa mi mafilu Poshe Yisrael asim Yisrael. He said, sometimes even people who sin do good things. They do mitzvot. And he said, in this case, he says, look, the father shouldn't have married these non-Jewish women, but their desire to bring the children into the community is a good thing. And he said, look, it is true. He said, they're not likely to be observant. That puts it rather mildly. But he says, what does the community lose by taking these children in? He says, Mi odeo la mehen gedole Yisrael. He said, how do you ever know? Some great leader from the Jewish people may spring from among them, and he doesn't want to be guilty of pushing them away. So he rules in the end that it's a mitzvah to do it. And by the way, he also calls these children, interestingly, Zerah HaKodesh. He calls them actually holy offspring. He doesn't, Hildesheimer, by the way, responds to him and says, what are you talking about? Stam Goyim. He said, what are you calling them? Zerah HaKodesh. But these are the terms he uses. By the way, he cites in Bereshit uh, Yishmael, uh, 
where it does say in uh, Bereshit that uh, he calls both Yitzchak and Yishmael uh, Zaro. Hildesheimer's response to that is, but no one's ever done this before you. You're the first one to cite it, to which Kalish responds, well, maybe I was the first one to notice. Uh, but in any event, for, from my standpoint, I like Kalisher's response. And Gutmacher, who was another um, of Asir Tzion, it is interesting, both of them, by the way, were Kubalim also, in addition to being Poskei Halakha. He writes in Adarit Eliyahu, his, his Chivot. They're very fascinating. And he basically rules leniently on all questions of conversion. And he actually quotes an Agatha in the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin involving Timna. Timna, according to the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin 99b, comes to Avraham Yitzchak the Yaakov, the patriarchs of the Jewish people, and says, convert me. The patriarchs, according to the Sagadatha, reject Timna. Why? Because she came with Shem Davar. She loved the patriarchs, and she didn't come because she loved God. They reject her. As a result, the Midrash, the Agatha there, goes on to say, she married Eliphaz, and they give birth to Amalek. And after Amalek, ultimately comes Haman. Therefore, Rabbi Gutmacher reasons, the Achrayut, the responsibility is thrust upon a bed din, that when an individual comes and they want to enter into the Jewish people, if you reject, in quotes, a nefesh tov, and how you determine this is a matter of judgment, then you are really responsible for the destruction of the Jewish people. From my perspective, an identity is a difficult thing. I mean, I could talk about it more, but I'll stop now. These two responses indicate to me, and I want to also be clear, neither of these rabbis would ever read this, the implications that I read into this, but I do think it's the logic of their thought. I think, well, what do we lose by, uh, by bringing these people in and doing everything we can to adopt a policy of inclusion towards the offspring of children of intermarriage? I do hope to be able to give them a sense of strong Jewish, not just identity, I mean, I would really say yada, strong Jewish knowledge, as well, the, the, the last two responses I'll cite, and then, I, then I'll quit for, uh, for you. Osriel Hildesheimer has asked the same question in 1879. Non-observant fellow marrying a Jewish woman wants to convert to Judaism. They're not likely to be observant at all. Hildesheimer says, do not convert. And he says to the rabbi who asked him, we can't be guilty of converting someone to Judaism who is likely to be unobservant. We have an obligation to protect the integrity of the Jewish people. We need to save our own integrity as rabbis. His student, David Svi Hoffman, Malamed Lahoyal, with the same case, says just convert them. By the way, even Rabbi Hildesheimer says, you know, Shelot Ka'elu, Me'ashe'elot Ha'kashot Biyoter Shel Zmanenu. These are the hardest qu questions of our time because halakhically you could decide either way. I mean, I won't get into it now. There are lenient and stringent taktimim, precedents in the tradition. Rabbi Hoffman, and I think it's in this spirit that I'm actually speaking today, he says, convert them mutad le'echozat arav in the you, you just want to keep the evil. That might be a strong word. Well, that's his word. I'll, I'll translate it. That's an idiot. You, you that's right. An idiot. I mean, he's just trying to say, let's keep the evil. No. Let's keep the damage to a minimum. Given the re Limited, You right. see, the issue that you have here, and this is what I would say my studies do after emancipation, the question is, you have policy decisions to make. The tradition would let you go either way, so to speak. But the question then comes to be, well, what, what direction, what, what is best for the community here? How do you protect the integrity of the tradition? You and I would stand on the same side in regard to uh, Professor Finkelstein. Uh, I have no regrets that he was not given tenure. I'll leave it at that for the moment. Uh, but, you know, having, having made that, uh, that assertion, I think these are the struggles with which we all contend. And what I would at least hope is that people could treat one another with integrity and respect even as they disagree.